for that, in fact. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen here. Wait, can you all see the slides? Okay. Um, like Amanda said, if you've got any questions tonight or you want to pop something in the chat, um, and maybe Amanda can keep an eye on the chat and make sure I don't miss anything really important uh, that comes up, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get going. All right, so we're going to talk tonight about preventing disease in the garden. So my name is Lori. I'm the consumer horticulture educator here in Oakland County. And my background actually is in plant disease. So that is what I did when I did worked in a research lab is that I studied how pathogens, so those are the things that cause um, biotic disease like bacteria and fungi, get inside of plants, um, how the plants prevent that, try to prevent that from happening, and how sometimes the pathogens overcome plant defenses. So I studied all of those things. And um, I like to say I'm really, really good at causing disease. So that's how you study disease, right? Is that you make a lot of disease happen and you see what happens. Um, and then you test different things on it. So um, tonight I'm gonna flip that around and talk to you about how we use what we know about uh, pathogens and diseases and plants uh, to prevent disease in the garden. Right, and so our MSU extension programs are open to all. Um, we do have a number of resources for gardeners. I hope uh, you all are familiar with them. Of course, our website is mygarden.msu.edu. Um, if anyone ever is asking you about MSU Extension resources, that's a great portal uh, because it has not only the tip sheets and articles there, but it also has a link to Ask Extension where folks can write a question and upload up to three pictures. It gets routed uh, by a real person, looks at the question and gets routed to another real person who can help them. Uh, we do have the statewide hotline that's open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 a.m. to noon. Um, and folks can follow us on Facebook at the Gardening in Michigan site uh, to see what sorts of different classes and events and articles and things we are publishing. All right, so we care about plant disease uh, because plant diseases can be very destructive. Uh, probably at least a few of you, probably somebody, but just about everybody I talked to um, had some experience with this unfortunate uh, disease. Uh, which was um, a disease of impatience, a very common plant in the landscape, particularly for, um, for shady situations. Um, and there was an um, introduction of a plant called impatience downy mildew. Um, and you would start off uh, like with a picture on the left, nice flowering impatience. Um, and then over time, as the impatience downy mildew uh, progressed during the season, it would basically destroy the planting of impatience before the summer growing season was over. Um, so there's uh, still no resistance that's known to this, uh, but a lot of really important lessons have been learned about managing this. And so it's really no longer appearing um, in the in the trades, so it shouldn't be showing up any longer. Uh, but if you were someone who was unfortunate to have this situation in your garden, uh, some spores from that fungus can persist in the soil for five to 10 years. So you'd need to plant a plant that is not susceptible to this. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what those different words um, mean as we go. All right, so when I ask what disease is, um, most often I get people mentioning things like fungi, which do cause disease, um, but the definition of disease is actually broader than that. Uh, the definition of disease really is anything that causes plants to function abnormally. Uh, so that can be living things like fungi and bacteria. Uh, but when I work at the hotline or on Ask Extension, I get just as many and sometimes maybe more questions um, of diseases that are caused by things that are not living. So when something is caused by a living thing, um, we call it a biotic or like bio as in biology. And when it's non-living, we call it abiotic for non-living. And abiotic diseases are very important. Um, they are typically things that are they're caused by things that are caused by chemical or physical factors. Uh, they can mimic biotic disease. So what's shown in the picture here are a couple of tomatoes uh, with blossom end rot. And it kind of looks 
uh, like a fun some sort of fungal disease. But what it is, is really something that's caused by inconsistent watering. Uh, so the plant needs water to get calcium to all of the different parts of the plant. And when the waters in the plants are inconsistently watered, particularly if they go for longer spells with drying out, um, you may end up getting seeing these symptoms. Um, and, you know, if someone saw this and thought it might be a fungal disease, might lead them to spray a fungicide, which is an entirely, which would be entirely unnecessary in this situation. Really what needs to be done is just more consistent watering. Another issue is that sometimes these abiotic diseases can predispose a plant to a biotic disease. They might stress the plant or leave it weakened. All right, so if your chat is, is comfortable and convenient to you, maybe you guys can tell me uh, some of the things that you have seen that might cause a biotic disease, an abiotic disease, I'm sorry. What have you seen kill a plant that's not a fungus, basically? And that can include gardeners. <laughs> Anybody have anything they can think of? Let's see. What about temperatures? Right, uh, very high temperatures um, and very cold temperatures. I mean, sometimes I'm um, just a really quick transition from one or to the other uh, can cause, can kill a plant. Um, very high light or very low light or transitioning very quickly from one of those to the other, um, especially in the last, oh, water issues are huge. Yeah, and especially in the last few weeks, um, maybe people were moving plants outdoors. So if you'd started plants indoors and they were in a little bit lower light situation and then very suddenly moved them out into high light, even if that highlight is long-term, their preferred situation, um, with that set, rapid transition from low to high uh, can actually cause a type of burning in the plant. It sometimes happens people put house plants outdoors, so you gotta have to kind of ease things into that. Um, high winds, when we have high wind comes through that will break plants, damage plants, uproot things. Um, and as Amanda and Joe and, and Joan, Joanne mentioned um, either too little water, right? Obviously, you know, you don't provide a plant with, with the water that it needs, um, you know, that can kill a plant. Um, and also too much water. Um, each plant sort of has its own water conditions that it likes, right? There are some plants that live um, in water uh, while there are others that live in very dry conditions. So I'm making sure they get the appropriate amount of water for, for their needs. Um, and wildlife, well, wildlife are not really non-living, so they'd probably be another biotic factor. And um, I won't talk about them a whole lot tonight. They're one of the more difficult, um, difficult approaches, difficult problems to handle in plants. Um, they're the thing that tends to get people the most frustrated. Um, they don't really have other things to do, right? It's their job to find food. We put food out, they get pretty excited about it. Um, too little nutrients, as well as too much nutrients. Um, you know, when, when our plants are, are not thriving, things are issues, you know, our instinct is to, to give it something, to fix it. Um, and sometimes we put on fertilizers when they're not needed um, and those can stress plants, uh, just like having too little nutrient can. Uh, so this is a tomato plant uh, that I grew in a pot. And um, when you're growing things in containers, um, especially if you've got a rather large tomato, um, it needs to be watered pretty frequently. Uh, so you, get, you know, that's something like that nasty blossom and rot, uh, but when you're watering it constantly, it can be difficult to, uh, you flush a lot of nutrients out. It can be difficult to stay on top of the nutrients. I'm um, in this plant experience, as you can see this sort of stress color here, it experienced some different nutrient and water stress issues. A pesticide damage. It's really important when you use a pesticide to read the label um, and to use it, not just on the right plant and the right disease, but to use it at the right concentration and the right temperature. Uh, some Pesticides will damage plants if they're used when the weather is, is too warm. So you need to always make sure that you use those according to the label instructions. And then all sorts of home remedy damage. Uh, there's a lot of recipes out there for a lot of things that um, involve uh, chemicals that don't need to be on plants. Uh, so you don't need to be putting salt in our garden or salt on our plants. Uh, dish soap is very, very damaging to the leaf surface. The leaf surfaces of plants are coated in a waxy layer that can be disrupted. Uh, by the detergents that are in those. 
So, you know, there is a product called insecticidal soap. It's much gentler and it's much more appropriate product for plants as opposed to dish soap. So we see a lot of damage uh, from a lot of well-intended, but um, maybe um, poorly executed um, home remedies. And then salt, um, you know, it's very common to get pictures of, of problem areas. And when someone sort of scans out and gives us a, a better picture, we see that it's right next to a sidewalk or driveway where people might be salting in the winter. So my favorite thing, type of disease to talk about, because that's what I study, are biotic diseases. And biotic diseases are caused by things that are alive. Um, and these living organisms that we call, that cause disease, we call them pathogens. So there are bacteria that don't cause diseases, but the bacteria that do cause diseases are called pathogenic bacteria or pathogens. Same way, pathogenic fungi, or pathogenic viruses, we call those pathogens. Um, and something that's important to know, not only are, can these be devastating to a plant, much like an abiotic disease, but pathogens are transmissible. If I move my house plant outdoors and it gets a sunburn, and then I bring it back inside and set it next to another plant, the other plant won't get sunburned. But if I move it outside and it becomes inoculated with a disease, um, that pathogen might move to another plant. So biotic diseases are transmissible, meaning they can move from one plant to another which is really important when we're probably trying to prevent disease. All right. So when we talk about the formation of disease, these biotic diseases, we think about, we talk about a triangle often. And you can sort of think about the triangle like a three-legged stool. So if I have a stool that has three legs and I take one of the legs away, um, it's not going to be a very effective stool any longer, right? You're gonna tip over. And that's what we want to do with this disease triangle. So this disease triangle, to cause disease, we need to have three parts, and those three parts come together to have disease. So anytime we can disrupt this triangle or take away one of the legs of the stool, we can help prevent um, and reduce the chances of having disease. So the first part of the disease triangle, the thing we have to have, is we have to have the pathogen, right? So we have to have the living thing that causes disease. Um, we also need to have a plant, a host, that is susceptible to the, disease, to the disease. And then we also need to have the right environment for this pathogen to grow in. So just like um, animals and plants, uh, microorganisms have certain environments that they like to live in and ones they don't like to live in. And for pathogens, we don't want to create an environment that they like to live in. So when we have all of these things together, then we end up having disease. So the pathogens, uh, but the disease pathogens, um, so these can be caused often um, fungi, most people are familiar with fungi causing disease. There are also bacteria that cause plant disease, uh, as well as nematodes, viruses, and there's quite a few others. Um, some of them may have names that you're familiar or unfamiliar with, like oomycetes or phytoplasmas. Um, you may be familiar with diseases caused by those, but you may not know the words. Those are pretty common. So asters yellow, which is um, strikes fear in the heart of everyone who loves coneflowers, uh, that's the phytoplasma. So where do pathogens come from? Um, some are local to the environment. So if I go outside and I dig up some soil, um, I'll find all sorts of microorganisms in there, bacteria and fungi. Um, and some of those are things that are helpful to the plant, uh, but there's probably going to be some in there that are pathogens. Now, not every plant that's growing in that soil gets that disease, we'll talk about that, but there are things that are always in the environment. But then there are also situations where pathogens might be introduced. So in patients downy mildew that we talked about earlier, that was something that was introduced uh, by, the way, by way of uh, the landscape trade uh, when we had impatients that were infected with impatients downy mildew. So those got introduced. So they can be introduced by contaminated plants or plant debris. Uh, some diseases can be carried on seeds, uh, dirty tools and pots. Uh, one of the good, great reasons to control weeds in the garden is some, uh, the wild, some wilder plants um, might carry diseases that, can, um, that they can share uh, with the plants that we're trying to grow. Uh, the wind, so fungi and oomycete reproduce by small structures called that can travel very easily on the wind. 
Uh, some of them travel short distances, but some of them travel across continents on, on, wind, on the wind. So um, this is something that's very much, that's not completely in our control. And then another in fact, very important carrier for disease is insects. So when insects feed in the garden, um, sometimes they directly do damage, it's undesirable, uh, but sometimes the, the bigger problem is that they might be carrying a disease in their saliva. So when they feed on the plant, they carry that disease with them. And I always like to point out here a quick note on disease names. Uh, so diseases, plant diseases are usually named by their symptoms, um, but not by the pathogen that causes it. So you might be very familiar with powdery mildew, uh, but what you may not, may or may not know is that powdery mildews are actually caused by a whole lot of different fungi. Uh, there's a whole genus called Erysiphe, and uh, the fungi in this um, genus cause powdery mildew on different plants. Um, and that means that the powdery mildew that's infecting your cucumbers may or may not be the same powdery mildew that's infecting, say, your roses or your lilacs. So uh, these different, so sometimes things have the same name, but they may not be caused um, by the same pathogen. And if you, that can be helpful to know when you do have an outbreak and you're trying to decide, you know, how you might, say, if you're in a vegetable garden, how you might rotate your garden, or um, how, you know, what other plants in the area might be susceptible. The next thing you need to prop up this disease triangle is a host plant. And when you start studying diseases, it can get very discouraging because you, you know, looking at pictures of sick plants. Um, but it's really, the really good news is that most plants don't get most diseases. Um, but the flip side of that is pretty much every plant I'm aware of gets some sort of disease. Um, but what you really need is a combination of a susceptible plant, a plant that can get the disease, um, and that pathogen to be present in the right environment. And a lot of this is controlled by the plant and the pathogen genetics. So plants are born with a certain amount of resistance or susceptibility to different pathogens. So susceptible means that that plant can be infected by a certain disease. And then resistance means that the plant is able to restrict pathogen growth. Resistant plants won't necessarily be completely disease-free. They may still show some, or show, but just show milder symptoms of the disease, or it may show up later in the season. So um, it may show up, you, know, you may be able to get your whole um, cucumber crop in before the disease shows up. So here's a, an example of susceptible and resistant varieties. So this is a lilac. Uh, that is pretty clearly susceptible to powdery mildew. Powdery mildew won't kill a healthy lilac, but not everybody likes the appearance of it. Um, you can certainly try to make sure that you plant lilacs in environments um, that are, don't promote disease. Uh, but you can also, you know, make life a little bit easier by, you know, selecting a cultivar like Sensation uh, or President Gravy that is resistant um, to the disease. And then the disease will be less likely to show up, except in maybe more extreme years or extreme environments. So the last part of this disease triangle, the third thing that you need is the environment. So when I studied plants, I had, um, at different times I had, so one of the plants that I worked with a lot was barley, and I worked with a fungus that infects barley and causes a disease called barley stab. So I would take my fungus and I would spray it on my barley. Um, but if I just left the barley sitting out in the greenhouse or on my lab bench, I didn't get what a plant pathologist would call good symptoms. I would get very inconsistent symptoms and some of the plants wouldn't get very sick. So if I'm studying this, I need very strong and very consistent symptoms. And so I would create an environment that was very supportive to the pathogen that I was growing. I would put them in a misting chamber that would create a lot of humidity and the pathogen just loved that and it would grow and it would give me, again, what a pathologist and not a farmer or a gardener would call beautiful symptoms, right? So when you're studying the disease, your, your mindset's a little bit flipped, right? But as gardeners, what we wanna do is we want to create the opposite of that, right? You don't want the misting chamber um, with the pathogen present, you want the opposite of that. So just like plants and animals, have preferred growth conditions, so do pathogens. Um, what, a few things that say many of them have in common is that many of them thrive. You can think about these little microorganisms and they don't have much to protect them and they need moisture. So many of them thrive 
in environments with very high humidity. And not some, but not all, pathogens really love to live on leaves that are very wet. And then there are certain pathogens, particularly some that cause um, some different root rot that really thrive in excessively wet soil. So we wanna be really careful with our watering practices. The water itself can cause damage to the plant, but if we improperly manage water, we can also create an environment that's really helpful to the pathogen and, and resultingly be very damaging to our plants. We don't have 100% control over moisture when we're gardening outside. Obviously it rains and things get wet, um, but we're talking about reducing risk. So what we can do to avoid wheat leaf wetness, the things that are in our control, ways that we can reduce the overall time that leaves are wet, I can help us reduce that risk. All right, so we have all three of these things together, right? So when I had my barley, um, I had my barley with my host. Um, I had my pathogen, and my pathogen that caused this particular disease, and I would put them in this nice misting environment. And then I would get beautiful, like I said, a patho pathologist idea of diseases are a little different. I would get beautiful symptoms, which were very helpful for my research. Right? But if you're a farmer growing barley or you're a gardener trying to grow tomatoes, that's not what you want. You want the opposite of that. You want to disrupt this, right? You don't want the disease. All right, so how can we use this to prevent plant disease? Um, plant, preventing a plant disease is very important. Um, prevention is really the best strategy for disease management. You know, once your plant is infected by a disease organism and the damage that's caused, you can't fix what's damaged. Um, but, um, you, and you can't bring a dead plant back to life. Uh, you can, there are treatments that you can use to prevent the spread of things, but if you don't have disease, then you don't have to deal with any sort of treatment. Right. So some different things we can do to prevent the introduction of pathogens. And um, one is when we pr bring new plants into the environment, um, to inspect those plants thoroughly before purchasing. Um, you know, when you're picking out and choosing a plant, obviously we want to be respectful of plants that we haven't purchased, you know, but feel free to inspect the plant, look up and under it. Um, you know, you can lift things gently out of the pot and look at the roots. While different root structures may have different appearances, none of them should be mushy or brown. Um, none of them should be mushy. So you don't wanna purchase anything that already has some sort of issue. Um, not only might that plant be an ish, uh, have problems over the course of its life, but it might introduce that disease to other related plants in the landscape. You can also practice sanitation by cleaning your tools and pots between uses, um, controlling weedy plants, um, and monitoring for disease-carrying insects. Um, when you do have diseased plants, clean up after them. You know, in the fall, I like to leave many of my plants up over the winter. I like to watch the birds feed on you know, different cone flowers and other things that are in the environment. But if fall comes and I have something that's particularly, you know, showing particularly bad disease symptoms, foliar disease symptoms, that is something that I'll go ahead and clean up and get out of the environment. And when I do clean those up, I don't put those in my home compost. Um, our home compost often doesn't get hot enough to kill pathogens or a lot of troublesome weed seeds. Um, the industrial composters, uh, they hot compost those and those do get up to those higher temperatures. But in the, at the home environment, we often don't get hot enough for that. And so if we were to put that into our compost um, and then place it out in the garden the next year, uh, we might be reinfecting our plants. And the other thing, if you are growing in a vegetable garden, um, you don't have to rotate all of the time, but if you're starting to see a lot of disease symptoms, you know, you might want to rotate by family. So if you're having a lot of trouble on your tomatoes, you know, maybe you want to swap that out with, you know, that area out with something like squash, uh, just so that you're getting a little bit different, um, having different hosts there. Um, and so that maybe pathogens that have been um, growing, say, on the tomatoes for the last few years, I may not be able to, to do as well with, with the squash. So you don't have to rotate every year, but if you are having disease pressure, can be a great idea to rotate. And it doesn't just have to be in your yard. Um, if you're having a really terrible time with tomatoes, 
and you're seeing diseases over and over again, and you might try, you know, and you don't have a lot of room in your yard, you could try growing them in pots. I mean, also I heard a story recently about a few gardeners who sort of swapped. Uh, they took turns growing different things in each other's yards and then, and then shared them uh, because they were each having different disease pressure. So rotating those crops, trying new things, um, that can help uh, prevent some of that, some of those pathogen problems. Right. So if you are using tools or pots that need to be cleaned, uh, there's a different, couple of different ways to disinfect those. Uh, first, you want to just sort of wash it, get rid of any sort of soil or plant debris that's, that's hanging around. If you're using something like, uh, these are some of my seed starting trays, um, you can disinfect these with a bleach solution. So we say 10% bleach solution. That means taking one part of the bleach that's in the bottle to nine parts of water. So that would be like one cup of bleach to nine cups of water. And you wanna leave it sitting in that for about 30 minutes. Um, I like to save this up and do this all at once because the bleach, bleach mixture is really only good for about a day. It starts to decline in quality after that. You don't wanna use this for anything that's metal, however, because bleach can corrode metals um, pretty seriously. So you've got some nice pruners or clippers. You don't want to put those, you don't want to, don't want to soak those in bleach for 30 minutes unless you're trying to get a new pair and you need a reason. Um, but that will damage them, it will damage them pretty badly. Um, if you're trying to clean some of your metal tools, um, you want to use something that's not quite as corrosive. Again, you want to clean off any large things like um, pieces of soil or or leaf matter, plant matter that's on there. Uh, the alternatives um, are 70% ethanol, which is often recommended. Um, I don't know that that's terribly available outside of research laboratories, but it is effective if you do have access to that. And um, the other is the active ingredient um, that's in the um, Lysol. I know we don't normally make a habit of recommending individual brands, uh, but the active ingredient in Lysol is a very unfriendly, very long uh, scientific name that is not very approachable, but most people are familiar with Lysol. It does not have to be Lysol brand, but the active ingredient in Lysol is effective at um, cleaning things like our pruners. And the next thing you can do is not choosing susceptible plants. So choosing resistant plants, um, now that can be a different species. So that might be, um, you know, like, an example I gave where someone was having a whole lot of trouble with tomatoes, you know, maybe they took a rest from tomatoes for a few years and switched to a different plant. Um, or it might be choosing a resistant cultivar. If you've ever looked at a seed catalog for tomatoes, you'll notice a whole lot of um, little letters next to the names. There's usually a grid um, that has all of the different diseases on it that tells you which diseases those plants are resistant to. So you might be put, you know, choosing an entirely different species or you might be switching to a cultivar that has some resistance. An example where you might need to switch to a different species, I mean, is the disease called verticillium wilt. It's a fungal disease that affects uh, some common trees in the landscape like maple, plum, um, and viburnum. It's kind of a frustrating disease because the trees decline slowly over time and the fungus persists in the soil for quite a while. So if this is in fact what kills a maple and you put another maple in, um, the young maple would be susceptible to the verticillium wilt. So if you did in fact have verticillium wilt confirmed, you'd want to replace it with a conifer, maybe crabapple, beech, ginkgo, hackberry, um, something, there's a pretty long list of things that are resistant to it, but you'd really just want to switch to something else and you're most more likely to be susceptible successful. Uh, so you'll have a much easier time uh, just by switching to something that, that won't have an issue with the disease. The next thing you can do is improve the environment. Um, so, and my eternal struggle is, is I love plants and I think the solution to plant problems is always more plants. Um, and I want to put all of the plants in everything in my garden. Um, and I tend to put things in too closely. Um, and when I when you have things in too crowded, um, even if the weather outside is not humid, uh, you can create a nice, moist, humid environment. If you ever stuck your hand inside of something that was really bushy and you notice that there was, it felt more moist in there, uh, that's because that dense foliage can create a high moisture environment. So when we plant things 
too close together, um, we can create humidity where there's not. Remember how I said a lot of disease-causing path, disease pathogens like humidity, so we're creating that nice environment for them. When I go plant things in the, in the garden, I honestly do take a measuring tape. Uh, that's the only way I can keep myself honest. I, I know that little tiny tomato is going to be a massive plant at some point, but I have a terrible time believing it every single time. So I actually do go out and measure things out and that way I don't have too many tomato plants in a little tiny space. The other is, you know, choosing if a plant needs a well-draining site, choosing a well-draining site. So obviously we do have plants that can grow, you know, in muck and, and standing water. And but if it's something, particularly many of our vegetables, I don't like uh, dra poorly drained sites or standing water, you want to choose a spot uh, that's an appropriate moisture level. Uh, when roots stay in an environment that is too wet for them, that creates a really great environment for root rot. And then to follow uh, with your woody plants, good pruning practices, you're getting rid of things like crossing limbs or very dense foliage, opening things up to air movement and air moisture and reduce that chance of uh, disease. Okay, so you did this. You did everything I said and you still have disease anyway. We can't prevent everything. Uh, pathogens have been infecting plants for a very long time, longer than we've been growing them. Um, and some of them are very, very good at it and we can't, we can't prevent everything. Um, so diseases are going to happen. Um, if you wanna stay on top of what's happening, um, you know, look at your plants regularly. And I don't feel like I have to tell gardeners that too much, right? Because we grow plants because we love them and so we're out and we're touching in them and looking at them. Um, you know, and if you've got your uh, smartphone or something like that with you, you know, taking pictures at different points in the season can be really informative. I was looking back at some pictures not too long ago of some cucumbers I grew and the disease seemed to come out of nowhere. But when I went back and I looked at the pictures, I had noticed like some really early signs of that disease sort of sneaking up on me. And so I had a better gauge to use for subsequent years to know when that disease was more likely to show up. And the other thing is to know what you're dealing with. Um, you know, if it's a vegetable garden, most folks know. Uh, landscape plants, people don't always know what the plant is, right? Sometimes we, you know, got something from a friend or, you know, it came with a house that we bought or we planted it and we don't remember what it was. Never happens to me, I promise. Um, but you wanna know what your plant you're dealing with because as I said, different plants are susceptible to different diseases. And so that can help you figure out what the pest is and to figure out what the problem is. Um, figuring out what the problem is, is really your best step to knowing how to manage it the best. Um, and once you've figured out the problem and what the pest is, whether that's you know, the disease or an insect pest, um, is to determine whether this is going to be something that you're going to tolerate, and whether this might be a plant that you need to remove, or whether this is something that there's a treatment option for. So not only knowing your plants, but knowing what is normal for your plants. There's all sorts of variegation, so that's different colorations of leaves that are available. And then that can be beautiful, but in a plant that looks unfamiliar, some of those sometimes look like disease. Um, and then just plants have different growth habits. These are both healthy tomato plants. Um, but if you looked at them, the one on the right is very tall and rangy, and the one on the left is very compact. Um, and that's just how those plants grow. Um, the one on the left is a compact variety called patio, and it grows very small and dense. Um, while is the one on the right, various grows really tall. It's an indeterminate tall, rangy, viney plant that um, is really, I guess, a little out of control, honestly. But what they're doing for both of them looks normal in that situation. So knowing what's normal helps you know when something is wrong. And this is honestly probably the easiest part, figuring out what the plant is. Identifying the disease. Um, I say this recognizing even as someone who studied disease, I don't always know what the diseases are. It can be challenging. Um, so, but your first, your best bet is to first look up the disease, first look up the plant. Um, because like I said, different plants have these different sets of diseases. So that narrows it down from all the plant diseases in the world to just the ones that the plant you have guessed. So for example, if I was having an issue on my tomatoes and I looked up tomato pest or tomato disease and follow that by the words, site colon dot edu 
and that would restrict it mostly to extension sites. And that would help me at least learn what some of the op options are. Now, if you've grown tomatoes, if you've grown tomatoes more than one year, uh, you know that tomatoes get a lot of diseases and it can be sometimes difficult to tell the symptoms apart. Uh, there's a couple of different things you can do. Um, one is you can upload some pictures to ask extension um, or contact us at the hotline. We can try to help you parse it out. Um, you can also submit samples. Um, we do have a diagnostic lab on campus. People don't do that as much for things like annuals or vegetables. People do that more for plants that they've invested more in, maybe things like trees or shrubs. Um, but you can submit them and get a definitive answer from the hotline. And there's also some online tools, um, like University of Minnesota has a little tool called What's Wrong With My Plant? So if you start with the plant, it shows you what some of the more common options are. Um, and for uh, vegetables, I really love uh, the tomato disease tool from Cornell. Um, and Mary asked me how you can tell whether a plant is affected by an abiotic or biotic disease. So something that you could tell, so if you're looking out into an environment and you see that an arbor variety and the lawn nearby and some coneflower are all suffering symptoms. Those are three plants that are not likely to be related to each other. And um, so that is more likely to be an abiotic disease. So something that's having some effect like that, um, that can be more likely to be abiotic. Uh, biotic disease symptoms, not all of them, um, but some of them you will see symptoms like um, lesions that spread. Um, some of them are more helpful and have furry or fuzzy shapes on them. Um, but there are some things that are really difficult to tell, like root rot. Um, you know, those are biotic diseases, uh, but, you know, the plant just sort of wilts. So that's not always obvious. Um, I, when I'm trying to diagnose something, I kind of like to start with the abiotic options and consider what things might be. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the first tip that it's probably abiotic is that it's affecting different plants of different species. Um, and then you kind of have to go from there. And diagnostics is not a thing we tend to learn overnight. Um, even with somebody who, like I said, spent 16 years learning about plant diseases, I don't always know what the diseases are. There's a lot I don't know. Um, we meet with the diagnostic lab on a regular basis. Our team does to help us uh, parse some of these things out. There's, there's just a lot of stuff out there. So I don't say that to be discouraging. I, I say that to be encouraging that this is something that we're all always learning for a long time. All right. So let's say that you have identified your disease. Um, and then you have to figure out what to do next. So not all diseases will kill a plant. There are many diseases that plants can tolerate. Uh, they may have symptoms that we dislike, that we might find aesthetic aesthetically displeasing, but they may not kill the plant. Um, one of them is maple tar spot. Um, it's a fungus that infects some of our maples earlier in the season. Um, and then as you get later in the season, uh, closer to the fall, uh, you see these very distinctive dark spots. Uh, so the picture on the left is a Norway maple earlier in the season. I mean, on the right, you can see a silver maple later in the season. That the silver maple has that really tar-like appearance. And it's very, very common in Michigan. Um, a lot of maples get it, particularly um, Norway and silver maples. Um, and more often than not, I can find it on a maple tree around Michigan. Um, but it's unlikely to threaten the life of a tree. Um, it's more of a cosmetic issue. So this is something that you can live with. Um, you know, if you only have one tree in your landscape that's getting it, you know, you can try to rake up the leaves um, and try to get them out of the environment um, and maybe not inoculate the plants for next year. Uh, but I, I am always a little hesitant about recommending that because uh, it's so common in the landscape here. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how realistic uh, that that is. So I always like to put a little asterisk there and say that that is theoretically what you can do, but I recognize that that's not always practical. Um, another thing towards the end of the season, a lot of plants have powdery mildew. Um, Menarda, bee balm, doesn't even have to wait till the end of the season. Um, so right, it shows up powdery mildew. Um, we can go in, we can do things like, uh, you know, prune out some extra plants, you know, thin out the environment, make sure that we put them in a good environment with some airflow. 
Um, but towards the end of that season, there's just a lot of things, uh, these leaf diseases that show up. So we might clean them up at the end of the season, um, but if this isn't going to kill a stand of bee balm. Um, it might just be something that's a little unattractive at the end of the season, and we can, you know, manage that for the upcoming season with some sanitation. There are some environments, so some situations where we might need to entirely remove a plant. Uh, some of the most frustrating diseases to get are plant viruses. Uh, we do have some management options for uh, others, uh, but for viruses, we don't really have very limited management options for. Um, except for removal of the plant. Um, this is a rose that has rose rosette. Um, and uh, there's really not, it's, it's carried by a mite and it's, there's really nothing that we can do. This plant is, has rose rosette. Um, and if it's allowed to persist, um, then those mites um, can, you know, go to this plant, grab some of this virus, you know, as they're feeding, and then they can travel and take it to other viruses. So uh, these are, this is an, a situation where we might need to remove the plant. Uh, the next option would be treating. And there's not all treatment options um, include fungicides. Uh, there might, there's other ways to do this, um, things like pruning. Uh, so this is a disease called black knot um, that's occurring on a chokecherry. Um, this occurs very commonly on ornamental, edible, and native plums and cherries. Um, and particularly for trees that are not terribly affected, you really can just go, at, go in and prune out these galls, these growths, um, and prevent further spread of the pathogen. Um, if something's very, very susceptible, um, fungicides might need to be involved, or you might need to choose a plant that's less susceptible. Um, but pruning out these galls is a treatment that can help reduce uh, the, the spread of this pathogen. There are chemical options for treating, um, particularly for fungus, fun, fungi and oomycetes, we have fungicides. Um, but as a qualifier, these can really only be used to prevent fungal disease development. So, you know, if I showed you that picture back there of that very um, seriously of the um, maple tar spot, by the time you see those maple tar spot symptoms, um, fungicide isn't effective. You would have to spray it far earlier in the season, back when the pathogen um, what's first present uh, to prevent that disease. So if you sprayed it in the fall, you would have put out an, an unnecessary fungicide. Okay. Um, and this is something that applies to both organic and conventional options. Um, when you look at one of these, so if you ever pick up the label for one of these, but all of the really, really important stuff is tiny and very, doesn't look like it needs to be read, but that's where all the important stuff is. Um, that's where you want to look and see what the active ingredients are. And I, I know these are not friendly. Uh, sometimes I like to get the name of the chemical and look that name specific name up online so that I can read it online. It's much easier. Or I take the readers out or I take my phone out and take a picture and zoom it in. Um, but you want to make sure that it's effective against the disease of concern because not all fungicides treat all fungal diseases and that it's approved for the plant that you're using. Uh, there are some diseases of um, apple trees that affect both the apples that, you know, ones that produce apples that we eat as well as crab apples. Uh, but the, and the fungicide will prevent the uh, is a disease that occurs on, occurs on both. And there's fungicides that will prevent them, but you can't use the fungicides on the ones that you're going to eat the apple. So that's all, there's lots of really, really important stuff in that little tiny writing. Um, and so you wanna follow that label guidance. Okay. So preventing um, disease, uh, sanitation, uh, choosing uh, you know, smart plants, putting them in the right places, um, inspecting your plants, uh, pruning, and then other environmental management, and then chemical defense if needed uh, can help you, you know, prevent disease and then manage it when it does inevitably occur because it will always happen. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions after the, um, just one moment. I'm gonna show you one more slide. Um, so the programming that offers MSU Extension is open to everyone, and we are um, required to ensure a civil rights policy adherence. Um, we do ask if you are willing, as would be very helpful to us, is to provide demographic data. Uh, providing the information is voluntary, and it's in no way required, but it is helpful to us to demonstrate uh, to the folks that fund my position uh, that I am out in the community. Um, you can hold a phone take a picture of that and it will direct you to the website um, or I can uh, post it in uh, post it in the chat.
All right, and with that, I will take, I'll take any questions that you've got. All right, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions for Lori. Um, thank you for that <laughs> scary and informative decision. You know, <laughs> diseases are out there, they're out to get us, but we can stop them. You know, it's, it's kind of like the animal, right? I, you know, I get really frustrated. Um, I went outside and something had chopped the top off of several of my lilies. Um, that's pretty irritating, but the animal that ate it, right? The animal's just trying to feed itself, right? Fungi, bacteria, the pathogens, they're doing what they do. Um, and, you know, it's, we do our best to, to grow despite, grow things despite that. And think about it, we grow a lot of things, right? There's food and beautiful flowers. Most things don't get most diseases. So rust on crab apple. So like cedar apple rust? Yes, cedar apple rust. And, and I don't really have, um, I have some junipers around, but not right next to the uh, particular crab apple, but I have three crab apples that are all showing indications of that. So I don't know whether it's because my neighbors have cedar or junipers. I, I don't know how far it travels. So I was asking about a disease called cedar apple rust. And the rust, if you're a pathogen or fascinating diseases, there are also fascinating if you're a gardener, but maybe pretty frustrating, um, is that they require two hosts. So um, something in the rose family, like an apple or a cherry, and then something like an Eastern red cedar. And they create these really fascinating galls that you might see in the spring. You might have, may have seen them at some point. They're kind of large and orange and they kind of look like they have jellies jelly arms hanging out of them. They're fascinating looking. Um, but the, the rust travels back and forth between those. So if you have a crab apple right next to an Eastern red cedar, um, then yeah, you're gonna have a lot of problems and that can actually threaten the life. You know, that, that can be just, just severe enough. Um, in general, um, rust is usually not like a, a life-threatening issue on crab apples. Um, if, you know, if, avoid, you know, tolerance, is, is one option for management. Um, there are preventive fungicides. I, I hesitate to give uh, fungicide names off the top of my head just because it's a, it's a really easy place um, to mistake those, um, but I can email you some information um, uh, that has specific recommendations. I just like to be very, uh, I like to be very cautious when I'm speaking like this. It's, it's just, a, it's, a good, it's a good way to make a, a, a pesticide mistake. Um, so, but yeah, so there are uh, recommendations for those. They need to be sprayed a little earlier in the season and it does require also multiple sprays and the spray that is used for that can't be sprayed on trees that are going to be consumed. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, the best way to clean the pruner with no bleach. And um, so that's where you want to use, um, some, so Rosemary's asking the way to clean the pruners with no bleach because we said we don't want to, <laughs> Don't want to soak the pruners in bleach, not unless you were wanting new pruners. Um, so you want to clean it off. Um, and then um, something with this, the, the active ingredient in Lysol, um, that can be used. So you can spray that on. And um, once the, you know, once you've got the surface clean, you can spray that on and then you can wipe them off. And then that's very effective without damaging, um, without damaging the, uh, the pruners themselves. Um, is there a particular reference you would recommend for identifying plant diseases? Um, there is. So is, is there a particular like like guard, like vegetable garden diseases or tree diseases? You can unmute yourself and not vegetable. Okay. Um, so there is a book. So like I said, I usually start with looking at the plant itself. Um, and then oftentimes, you know, there's a, a lot of common diseases. Um, and a lot of times those do have good extension articles written on them. So like I said, that like the University of Minnesota site. Um, <laughs> okay, so Mary says not vegetables, but David says yes, vegetables. Um, is, is, you know, looking up the plant on something like that um, and then identifying the possible diseases. 
Um, there are some different books that are available. I do not have I do not have them in front of me, and I can't think of the name. Um, maybe I can send those names uh, tomorrow to Amanda, and Amanda can share those with you. Um, the ones that we use the most. Um, but I do use a lot of extension sites, like I said, to at least eliminate the most common things. I mean, rare things happen, but common things are fairly common. So, all right. Anybody else have any questions this evening? I've got one for you. What about the early and late blight in tomatoes? Any way to prevent that, treat that? Um, so early in my blight, uh, there are resistant, there are resistant cultivars to, I don't know if there's resistant cultivars to both of them, um, but you can get resistant cultivars. Um, some of your general, if, you know, if that's something that you're having in a site, um, you might need to rotate um, or to get some of those resistant varieties. Um, you might also try uh, growing in containers. Are you having a, like a persistent problem with those? I'm just curious at this point. I know it's something that <laughs> comes up, so. Oh, okay, yeah. So like I said, I mean, I would first start with maybe rotating out or getting a, um, getting a hold of some resistant varieties um, is, a, is a great place to start with those. Um, and then if, you know, if a disease is happening over and over again with the same plant, uh, you know, you, it's, it's a, that's a good place to start is to change one of those things. Did anybody else have any, any other questions or comments? Feel free to unmute yourself or use chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. Hello, um, this is Mary. You know, what would really be useful, I think, is to have a tool, you know, sort of like when you, you, you call a nurse and, you're, and she's, she's um, going through a series of questions uh, to, to determine what's wrong with you. It would really be neat to have a tool like that that says, you know, is, is the soil too wet? Is it, have you moved the, have you moved the plant recently? You know, I mean, all these, and so eliminate it, the abiotic and then, and then, uh, you know, start on the biotic, you know, just have a little cheat sheet sort of. Well, we do uh, there is like a fairly common list of, of diagnostic questions. It's the kind of 20 questions. Um, I don't know that I necessarily go through and check off every question, but maybe if I, I do tend to find them helpful to think about. Um, as I'm thinking about a problem, um, I can send a link to that um, tomorrow as well. Thank you. Yeah. All right, anybody else? I've got one more for you that I, I okay. have dealt with, but I think I just got rid of the plant. So I solved it that way, <laughs> but for curiosity <laughs> purposes. That's a legitimate solution. <laughs> uh, rust on hollyhocks, any good oh, solutions for that? I, I, got rid of, I got rid of mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are some that are supposed to be resistant, but I don't. I don't know that they are. Um, sometimes I think there might be a different species, but off the top of my head, I don't. I was also having trouble with them, and I think I, I got rid of them because I also got tired of, of of fighting them. But I think there are some rust resistant options. I'm not sure if they're a different cultivar or just a different, like similar species. Um, yeah. um, I would not plant any. Um, the same rust that affects those affect, um, I think it's the wild mallow. Um, I'm not sure what that, there's a wild, a wild mallow. I mean, that also gets the rust. So not having both of those around can help as well. Okay. Well, if anybody else had any other questions, feel free to chime in. Otherwise, thank you very much for spending your evening with us. And All right, thanks for having me. It was nice to see everybody. Yeah, maybe one of these days we'll have to do it in person if we can get <laughs> everything in line like we want to. So. Certainly. Right. Thanks, Lori and Amanda, for putting this together. It was really interesting. All right. Well, have a nice evening, everyone. You Take too. care. Have a good summer, Lori. Bye-bye.